At SXM, we're taking travel and tourism to new heights. Here we boast spacious check-in areas, 10 passport control points, comfortable departure lounges, and an exciting new airport mall. Finally, there's an airport in the Caribbean that takes your travel plans as seriously as you do. Princess Juliana International Airport. The experience will move you. Now presiding the Honorable Judge Dick. Welcome to Dick's Court. I'm your host, Judge Dick. And of course, court is in session. Now, of course, it's all about um, looking at the court cases that the Daily Herald reports, uh, making sure that uh, you know what is going on, um, you know what people are being sentenced for. Because, yes, you hear about the accidents, you hear about the shootings, you hear about the killings, you hear about the kidnappings, you hear about everything that happens at the moment. But then afterwards, something else happens and then you just forget about it. I'm here to remind you of the things uh, people get convicted for or not convicted. Hello. Hello. All right. Next quote is in session. I like my gavel. Uh, let me start out. Suspended sentences. Oh, it's a bad start. Suspended sentences, community service, as usual, for careless street race that injured four persons. Interesting? I know. The court of first instance on Thursday found Karen Sidat Bailani and Christoph Carty, or Christopher Carty, uh, 34, guilty of participating in a street race that left four seriously injured when Bailani's grey Audi S3 crashed into a garbage truck on the Bush Road around 4.45 a.m. Saturday, January 29, 2022. Now, I don't know if you notice, but I think that's the president of parliament, son. Because he has the same last name. See that, Belani Karan, 28 years old. Okay, let's continue. They were both sentenced, according to the prosecutor, demand for their roles in what the court described as careless street race. The high-speed duo each received a suspended six-month prison term on two-year probation and two-year ban on driving a motor vehicle. They were also jointly ordered to pay about $31,000 in compensation to two victims. If they refused to pay, they would each Bum, bum, bum. have to spend 225 days in jail. Additionally, the court imposed 180 hours of community service on Bailani, while Kati got 240 hours of an unrelated assault charge. In that case, the court found Kati guilty of intentionally using his car to knock his girlfriend to the ground after a heated argument on November 5th, 2022. First of all, Daily Herald, how dare you put it in, like you, you just like slide it in, like yeah, he get uh, he gets some community service for knocking down his girlfriend after a little argument back in 2022. <laughs> Sir, don't be knocking down the girl after you have a relationship with her. What? What? And then he gets community service for knocking the, like, intentionally knocking her down. 
<sighs> I'm not supposed to have any opinion about it. This is in the Daily Herald. Don't blame me, but it's nuts. Anyway, because Kati is on probation for previous conviction on assault charges, the, the court on Thursday also ordered him to sit the suspended three-month prison term that he had received in his October 2020 case. Surveillance camera footage of, on January 2022 crash was shown during the trial on August the 31st. A garbage truck has been picking up trash along its signed route on the Bush Road and was heading towards Prince Bernard Bridge. The truck driver put on his left indicator and had started to make a left turn by toy and party store Super City. At the same time, the Audi driven by Bailani was speeding on the Bush Road towards Scurry Fort. The truck driver hit the gas, tried to clear this his vehicle from an oncoming car. And Bailani also swerved to the left to avoid a coalition, but the Audi still careened into the truck's rear right side. Whew. This is hot. The force of the impact lifted the garbage truck rear end and tossed the two garbage collectors hanging on the back of the truck a few meters into the air. They landed hard onto Super City's concrete parking lot. Ooh. The collision was so intense that the Audi's engine block broke free from the mount and was ejected out of the vehicle's hood. It landed in the middle of Bush Road in a cloud of thick smoke. Following closely behind Bailani's Audi, Audi was a white Volkswagen um, driven by Kati. He managed to avoid the damaged Audi and garbage truck but crashed head on on the Audi's engine block. Based on the time it took for the cars to cover the distance from the Daily Herald building to the point of impact in front of Super City Police estimated that Bailani was traveling about 152 kilometers per hour when the Audi hit the garbage truck. Okay, no, it ain't done yet. Police arrived on the scene shortly after the accident. They found the two garbage collectors um, on the ground in pain along with a dazed Bailani who had managed to exit his damaged vehicle despite injuries uh, to his head and arm. They also found Cartes trying to pry Bailani's unconscious from severely injured passenger out of the Audi. Police ordered him to stop because he could aggravate out the Audi passenger's injuries, but he did not listen. Officers had to arrest him to put his, uh, him from trying to rescue the passenger. The Samaritan Fire Department later freed the Audi passenger from the wreckage and he had been sleeping in the car at the time of the accident and woke up in a Curacao hospital with a broken knee, pelvis and ribs. So wait. You went into a race with a guy sleeping next to you? And then he woke up in a hospital in Curacao with a broken pelvis. Okay, no, a broken knee, pelvis, and ribs. I ain't talking to you no more, boy. <laughs> you, you the friend that my mother, that my mother tell me not to mess with. No, 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 no. During the trial, both defendants denied being involved in a street race. And their respective lawyers argued that racing was not their intention. However, based on videos taken from Carty's passenger's mobile phone, <laughs> you, you tape yourself to racing? Whew. 
The mobile videos were shown during the trial, and one depicted Cathy's vehicle driving hard behind Bailani's Audi on the Walter J. Nisbet Road, Ponfield. They stopped next to each other in front of the roadside, and Bailani was smiling and could be heard saying, You're rich! Cathy's passenger then asked Bailani, Yo! Would that be a V8? Cathy passenger then becomes animated and starts saying several hard to hear phrases. But as Bailani pulls off at a high speed, Cathy passenger says, We're gonna smoke your ass! <laughs> I really know more. Let me get to the <laughs> sentence in here. <laughs> um, one let me see, 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 let me see. Yeah, so they were sentenced already. Yeah, I think I, I gave you the sentence. So basically, the court, uh, both of them were found guilty of participating in a street race. Um, on January 29, 2022, and they were ordered to pay $31,000 to the victims. Ay, ay, ay. Crazy. Let's go to uh, another case. All right, let's continue the session. 21 months given for having a loaded gun. Okay. The court of first instance on Wednesday sentenced Jahim Simon to 21 month prison sentence with six months suspended uh, and uh, three years suspended on three year probation for having a loaded firearm in possession on July the 2nd. On that day, police received a report that a man on a dirt bike was threatening people with a gun near the Little League Stadium on the Pond Island. When they got to the scene, they saw the 20 year old defendant riding off on a motorcycle and ordered him to stop. He refused and led police on a short chase which ended with police violently arresting Simon. During the action, a Sig Sajar pistol came out from under his shirt and fell to the ground. It was cocked with a bullet in the chamber and another six rounds of live uh, bullets in the magazine. During Wednesday's trial, Simon told the judge that he had found the gun on the baseball field, which coincidentally was some five minutes before he was arrested. He found it on the, he found it on the ground. He was driving his, his, his motorcycle. It makes sense, judge. Come on. He was driving his motorcycle, you know, doing the wheelies. And he was like, oh, a gun. Let me take it. And put it underneath my shirt. And get you my wheelies. It makes sense. Come on, judge. Anyway. Um, immediately, the judge told the defendant that she did not believe his version of the events and Simon had been shot in the belly in January 2021 and the judge asked if the reason why he had a gun was because he was looking for the man who had pulled the trigger. Simon denies this. He pinned to his story that he found the firearm moments before police took him into custody. It does not matter if he found the gun a year before or a day before or a minute before. This does not matter to the law. The prosecutor said, considering the charge of gun possession proven, the fact that he still picked, picked it up, held on to it and had it ready to fire for the crime, the prosecutor demanded 21 months in prison, of which six months would be suspended on three-year probation. Additionally, he asked the court to impose two more months of prison time because Simon on probation for December 21 conviction on a robbery charge. In formulating these demands, the prosecutor said that he wanted to send a clear signal about the seriousness of gun violence in St. Martin. But he does not want to send a clear, 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 clear message about pedophilia in St. Martin, I guess. Because 
Anyway, that was last week's show. I don't want to get upset again. Um, anyway, the judge found that Simon had not been completely transparent about how he came into possession of the gun, adding that he is probably uh, wanted to use it against the man who had shot him. Uh, it is lucky that you did not find him because then you would be sitting before me for manslaughter or murder, she told the defendant before giving the sentence of 21 months. One more. The court convicts teenager for having an air gun and threatening. Oh, this is this, this should be interesting. The court of first instance on Wednesday handed down a suspended six-month term in youth detention and 60 hours of community service to a 17-year-old boy for being in possession of an air gun and for using to, to threaten someone earlier that year. The teenager stood trial on Wednesday on two counts of being in possession of an air gun commonly known as a BB gun. He was also suspected of threatening a man with it on May the 28th. Although not lethal, an air gun can cause serious injury and is forbidden under Sinmat's law. Despite being only 16 years old at the time, the defendant had borrowed his brother white Hyundai i10 that day and was driving around with two others. Okay, so we're not gonna we, we're not gonna talk about he being 16 and he borrowing his brother car. Nobody. Okay. Hey, borrow me a car now. No problem, bro. Thanks. Anyway, okay. Simata is a real place. Let's continue. And I'm a real judge. Um, on the first charge, the boy admitted to having an air gun in his possession on November 23rd, 2022. Despite being only 16 years old at the time, the defendant borrowed his brother white Hyundai i10. Police stopped the vehicle because it was tinted and the officers asked to search the rest of the car because they smelled marijuana. It was in this search that they found an air gun on the floor. Police then arrested the group and sent the gun to be tested to determine if it could fire live um, ammunition. The teenager spent two nights in jail and he worked out a deal with the prosecutor's office for 40 hours of community service. However, he had only completed 15 and a half hours before Wednesday's trial. The second and third charge related to the altercation on May 28, he told the court on Wednesday that he was riding a scooter that day and a man walking along the road had hit him. That was when he pulled out the air gun to scare off the attacker, he told the judge. However, the man filed a complaint with the police telling them that it was the teenager who had attacked him and he had only picked up a stone to defend himself. Just so you know, stone versus air gun. Um, air gun wins. Just, just so you know. Uh, police arrested the teenager after the altercation and um, at this time he spent three days in jail. In the search of his home, they found an air gun by the television stand. During Wednesday's trial, prosecutor asked the teenager if he had considered the danger he was putting himself in by walking around with an air gun to scare away would-be at attackers. At a distance, nobody can tell that an air gun is not real, the prosecutor said. What happens if you try to scare somebody who has a real gun and they decide to use it? Based on the defendant's statements, the police and those of the victim on May 28 altercation, the prosecutor considered the charges legally and convincingly proven and demanded 140 hours of community service, of which 40 would be suspended on two-year probation. All right. Okie dokie. So now, uh, my ruling is as follows. For those having a loaded gun, um, come on. Uh, we have very strict gun, la um, gun laws in St. Martin. Uh, apparently, you, you, you do more time for um, having an illegal weapon or using an illegal weapon than um, 
real other crimes uh, that matter to the society. Uh, so, at the end of the day, um, not because our jail is full means that you get to just break the laws, don't care about the consequences, and then when you end up in jail or you end up in um, in, in, in police station detention in Phillipsburg, you start to go like, but you know how it is, I, at least I get in three meals a day. Yes, behind bars. Let's finish the sentence, behind bars. Um, freedom is something that you have to hold tight to because when you don't have it to walk my friends it ain't nice um uh, when it comes to the the two persons that caused four persons to be injured for the street race and to tell the judge that it wasn't a street race however <laughs> you tape it on your phone what's wrong with this generation and they're my age you know <sighs> why would you tape? You ready? You ready? You ready? You ready? Let's go! You see, Fast and Furious. Where, where are you? Are you in a Vin Diesel? And are you think are you can swerve? And uh, I mean, it was not the smartest things to do, especially at the time that it took place, because it was 4:45 a.m. What the? What the f you was doing driving so fast on the bush road, a main road. And how is it that you're not going to take into account that your father is the president of parliament? That does it for the court today. Um, you are dismissed. Let's see if we do better with justice next week. Look, MP Bryson, I have yes. look, MP Bryson. This is exactly why I have confidence in you. You're a very intelligent young man. I know that from from day one when I met you, which I I. You know how that goes. Yep. And this is the level of discussion you need in Parliament, right. in those committees. I hope the, I hope the audience and the people are listening. This is the level right here would love nothing better than to say, let's allocate 10 million guilders towards helping our issues in social needs and so on. But how are we to do that when we have all of these conditions of, well, you can't get more liquidity, you need to cut, you need to do this. We, many of us feel like we're in a position where we can't fully extend our ability to legislate. But my decision is to stay where I'm at. Mm -hmm. I, 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 um, at the end of the day, the way that MP Rolando Bryson leads, he allows me to work. He gives me that freedom to work. It, it's not always a full call of pressure or do this, do that, don't do this, you know? And that's part of the reason that I'm able to, to produce. Any of the difficulties that this government faces today, I didn't sit down, do nothing, and have my staff write press releases. No, I got up and asked myself from opposition benches, what can I do? So I read my constitution, the one I swore to uphold, which gives us the rights to bring laws, to bring amendments, interpolation rights, inquiry rights. So we asked ourselves the questions at the time. What have we done? Regardless of... He has represented this country qua what is expected of a parliamentarian professionally, and I can align myself with that simply gone through a very difficult economic time and are simply asking of the tax department an opportunity to have a payment plan and it seems that this is really done kind of like if they feel like um how you talk to them you know it's it's extreme We probably go far, and we know search for a sign of a change. And you know, you know, it got days when you feel like a zero. I woke up this morning, but feel like my mango. Tomorrow be a better day. Respect is the key, education gon' matter, so don't you try to run away. So I'm out in the place where the food is good, the people is good, the music is good. We living like we on a rose. 
try to take us down, but I'm thinking, could they really go? Misunderstood. Oh, Lord, help us protect ourselves. Help us look in ourselves. We're searching for what they call the fire that's in ourselves. I just want to see the best for my motherland. I just want the whole world here to understand that we came from the bottom of the sewer. Now we had to wait up, high up, until Wonderland. Opportunity is yours, so make it happen. Take an action. Change. Some of them even say, is the guns on one go, go. So they won. Let me play. And they blame in polio. Who they think they could fool? All we know they better do pass. Polio or no polio. Man, we won, we must. Mama, when they hear, they go get it. And I'm oh, 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 all masqueraders on here. Well, they didn't care if it was official. But they start turning peace on the street. And they start to jump around. Yeah. All we know they better do pass. Polio or no polio, man, we won, we must. Mama, when they hear, they go get it on a bar. Oh, oh, all Qu'est-ce que tu fais là? Qu'est-ce que tu fais là? But, but sorry, no sir. But they got this game tonight and I can't miss it. Me and my boy, we gotta watch the game, you know? So I bring in this in, you check? All right, let me get, let me watch your leg, go. Watch your leg. <laughs> sir, sorry. Why so difficult? Look, I'm watching TV here on my phone with the Tell TV Plus app. You really gotta upgrade. Okay, so Miss, tell me about the Tell TV Plus. Yeah, I hear about this. Okay, so once you apply for Tell TV Plus, okay. you can enjoy it anytime on the go. Anytime. Anytime. On the go. On the go. You simply download the app, log into your account at any time, sit back and enjoy. You will never have to miss your match. Yo, boss driver, take me back to tell him now, please. If you've just joined us, you are watching the Council of Ministers press briefing. We now move on to the question and answer session. The floor is open and Bibi Hot Shaw of Vestaman News, you're up. Good morning. Thank you, Laika. Good morning, colleague. Good morning, ministers. My first question goes to the Minister of VSR, Minister Otley. During the COVID pandemic, a travel insurance was implemented. Can you say how much this insurance yielded for St. Martin? and which company or country benefited from this if St. Martin did not? Also, can you shed light on the debt owed to one of the resorts for the Pretty Boy project? Um, can you tell us which minister exactly committed government to this, these expenses? And was there a bidding process for this? And the same breath, Minister, can you tell me where Thank in the you, budget Thank you, baby. Post that is three questions. I will allow Minister Otley to answer. Minister? Thank you very much, Bibi Hasha. We came loaded today. Very um, much. As stated, the, um, the $15 implementation fee was handled by the Ministry of TIAT. At that time, I was a member of parliament. Um, but however, um, I did come into the ministry after and during COVID-19. The insurance company happened to be a company out of Aruba, apparently. Um, to answer your both questions, this was on the minister, Ludmila Duiva, at that time. Um, she organized the procedure and dealt with the companies. 
Um, at the time, of course, it was something that I, I felt that I remember asking why isn't the local insurance companies involved, but she had her reasons, um, so she can be able to explain her reasons better. I won't try to explain for her, but however, it was through a company in Aruba, um, and when it pertains to the Pretty Boy situation or the Pretty Boy saga, <laughs> um, you asked who signed off. It was Minister Lumida De Weaver. I am not able to know what was her motivation at the time, as I was not in government at the time. I was a member of parliament. So again, she would have to explain. But yes, indeed, I have heard that um, there is still an outstanding, but that you would have to verify with Minister Leo Lambrix. Okay. Can Thanks. you say how much uh, the insurance yielded for St. Martin, if anything? Um, that amount, I don't know off the top, but I remember explaining to Parliament it was upwards of a uh, couple million killers. Thank Any you. Any of it came to St. Martin? Is that, I don't know, and I pretty much doubt it. I pretty much doubt it. I would have to verify, but I do know that the insurance company that was collecting those fees was a company in Aruba, and um, I'm 95% Sure that St. Martin did not yield any of it, but I can verify, as I don't, as I stated, this was done under the tenure of Minister De Weaver, so I don't want to speak any false information, but I can explain to the best of my knowledge, and what I can do say that the company was an insurance company in Aruba. Thank you, Minister Otley, and thank you, Bibi. I would now like to invite Stephen Cerulean of PJD2 Radio. You have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Roach. Good morning to you, ministers. Um, well, sometimes you come here prepared for all the ministers, and it so happens that they are not always present. That forced me to shift my attention somewhat. The Minister of Justice, um, we've heard in the past of the Chief of Police expressing his d desire to see in or achieve in a five-star police force. Is that any closer to realizing? And can you provide some information, if you may, as to the capacity of the police force at this time? Thank you for your question. You said the fast stop police force? They was looking forward to achieving a five star police force. Five star? Yes. Oh, sorry. OK. Um, I would have to speak to Chief John a little bit about that vision. Maybe it was something before my tenure. Um, I know that there are efforts to be able to, uh, and there's always trainings going on to be able to improve the police force. In terms of our capacity, we are still functioning how we were about a year ago because the ability to hire has been halted with the budget challenges that we've had. So I know that uh, we have an obligation, even with our um, how we call that now, project plans. We have to grow at a certain number on an annual basis that has been stagnated for the last couple of years, but um, the efforts to be able to ensure revenue is generated to suffice what we have to, um, the, the quota that we have to meet in terms of our police force is still a high and top priority, so we're trying our best to be able to do that. But I would gain more information from Chief John for you, and hopefully in the next press briefing I'll be able to advise. Thank you, Minister Richardson, and thank you, Stephen. We now move on to the second round. Bibi, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Raleika. Um, my question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Romi. Uh, Minister Doran, can you tell me how much has GEBE spent on consultancy with the revamping, and how much longer will this continue? Based on what I understood and the information that I've gotten is that GEBE um, their liquidity is as low, the lowest. For the past 10 years, it is very low. Um, can you also tell me what is the shareholder's position on this scary scenario? Thank you for your question, Bibi. Uh, with respect to how much they are spending or have spent on consultancy over the last couple of months, I simply don't have the answer to that at this point. Um, I'm not sure if that was communicated to the Prime Minister, um, so I will have to follow up with the Cabinet and get back on that point. And the second question was, what, how is this, how, what is the shareholder's position on their current liquidity um, position? 
I don't know their current liquidity support position at this point. So that will also be something we'd have to follow up on. Thank you, DPM, and thank you, BB. Stephen, you have the floor. The Minister of Justice again. Minister, earlier on you spoke of the substance abuse among our youths. Um, you said steps have been made in order to at least curb the problem. Um, can you give us an idea if you have any knowledge of the percentage of students abusing drugs or substance on St. Martin? Thank you for that very great question, uh, Mr. Cerulean, because it is a great focus of ours. Um, I won't be able to give you the actual numbers and statistics. Definitely, I know Dr. Thomas from Turning Point has those, um, but the, the concern is quite large. Um, there's even concern that a lot of our students are seen to it that they uh, engage in substance abuse prior to going into school. Um, many of them are not able to focus as they need to. Um, there is uh, concerns about the, the level of aggression that they are displaying has contribution from that as well. Um, there is campaigns being launched on our radios. There's going to be campaigns on our social media pages. You can look out for those. There's going to be more activities from Turning Point coming out to be able to discuss these because, as I mentioned before, for some odd reason, and I use the word odd because I still can't um, understand, there is some resistance from schools to allow Turning Point to come in and administer these awareness uh, platforms. Um, that for me is alarming. So in my discussions with Turning Point, I said, no problem. If we can't go into schools, then we make it a very public um, platform of, of awareness. So that's what we're driving to do. Um, we have, as I mentioned in my opening statements, a lot of different types of substances. Of course, alcohol is a part of that as well because we have a lot of youth that engage in that. Um, but in terms of the actual statistics, that is something we will have to publish within short. Thanks. Thank you, Minister Richardson. We now move on to the third round. Bibi, you have the floor. Thank you, Rulaika. Minister Artley, can you tell me um, the EAS funds, where has it been booked in the budget as an income for the government? And can you also tell me, as the acting minister of TIAT, what is the contingency plan for the food crisis? OK, great. The actual budget post number I'll have to give to you. But however, I can. Um, tell you that during the COVID crisis and when the hospital was overflown, overcapacitated, um, we had to find isolation facilities in which we did assist with that. Um, we got numerous bids. Um, we then assisted with the facility. We assisted with the community outreach programs and so forth when it pertains to vaccinations and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the exact budget report, I'll, I'll gladly let you know, um, definitely. But I can always say what happened, where the money went, and account for that money. And that money for EHAS, I would like to state, um, was not related to the entrance fee. The money you speak of is a testing fee in which a percentage goes to the Ministry of ESA and another percentage goes to the testing facility. Just wanted to make that clear. Thank you, Minister. Oh, food crisis, the food crisis. Yes, what is the contingency plan for the food crisis? A food crisis, like a shortage or yes. any of the uh, sort? Throughout the several countries already reporting yes. that there is a food crisis. And if you go to the supermarkets on St. Martin, most of the days, many shelves are empty. That is exactly. Well, that's actually a question. Now we speak for the Ministry of TIAT. As I was Minister of TIAT, remember, I, um, I went in not only met with the Dominican Republic, where we were going to start to see if um, the distributors in St. Martin would be willing to purchase from them as opposed from Miami for a cheaper cost. We had the meeting. The distributors were on board as long as the Dominican Republic can guarantee continuous supply. Even after that, we spoke about agriculture, in which everyone made a big deal. But that was a contingency plan where we was going to acquire large parcels of land elsewhere that's not in a hurricane belt and uh, we met with the local agricultural um, committees on St. Martin and we were starting the program. So that is what was in place when I was there. I would have to follow up with the Minister of TIA to see how far they are 
as I'm now back in VSR, and what you speak of is a responsibility of the Ministry of TIAC, but I'm pretty sure they're on it. But um, we will follow up with them to see, provide you with an answer. Thank you, Minister Otley, and thank you, BB. Stephen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Roach. My question is for the Minister of ESA. And, Minister, I'm going to pose a question to you. As a former Minister of TIAC, um, in acting, that is, um, the market place project started under your watch. Um, can you provide some information as to how far ahead is that project? How soon do we foresee groundbreaking and what have you? And what happens to the, the occupants of the location? Perfect, great question. Actually, actually the marketplace was something that was actually before my time and used as a political ploy. Why I say that is because um, upon my tenure as TIAT, I attempted to use the same design that was done before, and Rummy, the Ministry of Rummy stated that that design never passed their inspection. The design was basically not in line with regulations. So therefore, we met, we redesigned, we collaborated with the Ministry of Rummy and Royal Caribbean. We got the design, we got approval, and also, um, we were to rectify the budget. However, a swap of ministers, but I'm happy to announce that the minister did continue the vision. And according to the minister, not me, according to the minister, the groundbreaking is scheduled within the next couple of months. He is now, he had a meeting with the stakeholders who, the, ven be it the vendors, they are willing to be moved. The idea is to be moved to, from what I understand, the old government building parking lot. I guess I don't know if that's a collaboration that from you have to verify, but I'm only speaking what I understand. The vendors are willing to be moved because they want their new marketplace. So according to the Minister of Tiat, we are expected groundbreaking within the next couple of months. When I was there, I know we met with the stakeholders, everything was approved, and we're finally moving. He has took it over, and he has continued to push forward. And with his words, it'll be groundbreaking within a couple of months. Yes. Um, are you in a position to say as to exactly when the transition period will be taking place for the vendors? Not really, because I really don't want to say something <laughs> that put it. That's why I know that the process has started. From To my knowledge, they were in the process of acquiring the temporary facility, be it a tent or temporary facility to place the market vendors. But um, for safety net, he did say this is one thing that was related to me, is that within a couple of months, he plans to break ground. If I was the minister, I'll give you a definite date, but I don't want to speak for the minister and put him in an awkward position. But I do know he did say within a couple of months. Thank you, Minister. We now move on to the fourth and final round. Bibi, you have the floor. Thank you, Alaika. Minister Doran, where are we with the district cleaning contracts? And can you tell me, um, what I'm seeing, Minister, is that SOAB are being used for both tendering and recruitment, yet the advices for, uh, from SOAB, in my opinion, are not being followed. But I'd like to know exactly with the district cleaning contracts, where are we? With respect to the question on district cleaning contracts, they are very much active and they are currently cleaning the districts. So. That's, that's the current status of it. But who have been doing it? Is it Vromi people or were the contracts issued? The contracts was issued a couple months ago. Thank you. You're welcome. Stephen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Rich. My final question is for the Minister of Vromi. Mr. For some strange reason, the, wor the, the road markings have come to a start. Uh, a halt. We notice that the French side is continuing with this. Um, St. Peter's Road is still in a deplorable condition, certain places of the road, of course. Um, what, what's your plan for this stretch of road? Thank you. For, thank you for your question, Stephen. I'll um, answer the question firstly on the road situation in general, and then the second part I will touch on the paint. Um, Money is a major issue. <laughs> Finances is a main challenge that we have. 
um, as I mentioned here on, on various occasions, the budget that I have on a yearly basis is 2.1 million guilders, which can barely scratch the surface when it comes to the attention that our road network requires. I was really um, banking and still banking and awaiting the capital expenditures approval because in that we had um, 8.6 million guilders approximately in total when it comes to main roads and side roads, which a 3.6 was going towards hard surfacing of side roads with concrete and 5 million extra on top of the 2.1 million. So that would have definitely made, and I'm going to say will definitely make an impact once it's finalized. I spoke to the Minister of Finance last week and uh, CAPEX is awaiting final approval, if I'm not mistaken, still by the second chamber in order for us to receive those funds. It was approved by CFT. It was approved by the um, Kingdom Council of Ministers. And the last checkpoint is being awaited on so that we can um, move forward with that. So to tie it all together, the road painting and all of that will be in, in included in that. However, two weeks ago, we received the products, the, a better sort of paint then, so to speak, for the road pa painting. We're starting with the roundabouts and the zebra pattern and all the areas. So that those are the main focus right now. And then subsequent to that, once we receive the funds, we'll continue on a larger scale. Just as a follow-up, Minister, how much of the road tax payment is re-injected into the road project? As I mentioned, the budget on a yearly basis is approximately 2.1 million guilders. So um, that is the amount that it, that it received for, for repairing of roads. As a, if you, I think, of course, I know you're always paying attention to what's going on in the media. Um, a couple, last week when they had the opening of Parliament, I'm not sure if you noticed, uh, one of the points that was mentioned was the road fund. So that will definitely be a great help. That was something that had to have been finalized years ago. And um, I took it up a couple months ago, and we're in discussions now to finalize and get that going. And that will definitely be a more sustainable vehicle, so to speak, to have our road network maintained on a regular basis and also have the funding, more funding to do such. It all boils down to money. If, if I had, um, as I, met, I think it was about a year ago, uh, when we did an assessment with approximately 12 million guilders, we will definitely be able to put a lot into the infrastructure here in St. Martin and, and put it up to par, so to speak. Then it will be a matter of maintenance. What has been happening over the years is we're continually maintaining, but there's never no big impact. And that, by the time you finish here, there's bad, and, and that's the domino effect that we have. So I hope, I really look forward, as I mentioned, to the CAPEX, because that will definitely, it may, it's not enough, but it will definitely be a great impact for us. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Minister Duran. As time does permit, I will allow one more round. Bibi, you have the floor. Thank you. Minister Doran, can you give me an update as to when exactly the Dutch Quarter project will recommence? Um, the prosecutor's office, after quite a while, has said, yes, they approved um, using the Larimar fine to have this project uh, finalized. And at the same time, can you tell me what is the long-term plan for the Simpson Bay parking lot? With respect to the Dutch Quarter project, um, I had a town hall meeting over a month ago, and the project has commenced. There's a lot of um, preparatory work that needs to happen. They did start work down by the uh, one of the pits in the entrance close to the roundabout. Those things are happening. Parts and those things are being ordered as well. As you know, when dealing with these um, components, they are specialized, so it has to be tailor-made for the project. Uh, projected timeline was also given in that presentation at the town hall meeting so things are ongoing you might not see it in front of your eyes but it, a lot is going on with that they are um, regularly meeting with the department updating the department as a matter of fact today we have a meeting on it i have a meeting to get an update they are meeting regularly but today i have a meeting to get a um, kind of an update as to the state of affairs at this point and regarding the Simpson Bay parking lot, I don't have any information on that right now. 
Thank you, Minister Duran, and thank you, Bibi. Stephen, you have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Rich. I'm going to ask the Minister of Justice of the BAT. Mr. Um, can you say as to how many persons are currently incarcerated at the Point Blanche prison and how many of those persons are below the age of 20? A uh, question that I don't have the answer to at this time. Um, I know that we are not far from capacity if we were to focus on Point Blanche. Um, but in terms of the ages, I don't have that information. But as always, I can get and I can provide. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Richardson, and thank you, Stephen. Members of the media viewing and listening public, this does bring us to the end of the question and answer session. Members of the media, any further questions can be sent to the Minister's Cabinet in writing. Honorable Ministers of the Council, members of the media, radio listeners, and online viewers, this brings us to the end of the live Council of Ministers press briefing for today, Wednesday, September 20th, 2023. <laughs>